Welcome to an episode of In Range. I'm coming to you today from the relatively small town of Grinnell, Iowa. About 10,000 people. This is also now the headquarters of Brownells, but that's not the topic for today. I'm standing in front of this rather inconspicuous little house behind me, and inconspicuous it is, but the lot is not. This was once the homestead of Josiah Bushnell Grinnell, U.S. congressman, abolitionist, ordained minister who founded this town. And on that lot just behind me, John Brown himself showed up with 12 fugitive slaves that he had recovered in his anti-slavery raids into Canada and Missouri and brought them here to this depot where J.B. Grinnell protected them on their way to Canada. When you look up Grinnell, you'll find that this is considered the most famous event in Grinnell. But upon doing some research, I would have to disagree. This was not the most famous event. Well, it's amazing that J.B. Grinnell and John Brown were friends and they worked together in the Underground Railroad for the safety and protection of fugitives trying to get to their freedom. The reality is what turned into the 1860 school riots is what's far more interesting. So J.B. Grinnell was himself a descendant of 1600s era Puritans and was ordained in the Congregational Church. When Grinnell was founded here in 1854 based on the principles of abolitionism and human rights, he brought with him his church. And this is the location of the 1854 Congregational Church. And it's still a church to this day, still standing for its principles. So I'm actually at the grave of J.B. Grinnell and we're gonna complete the video here and about that. But first let's get to the point of the 1860 anti-abolitionist or really race riot. So not all fugitives trying to make it to Canada get there. Some of them land up staying behind and that certainly was a thing that happened here in Grinnell. And J.B. Grinnell and the community being part of the congregational church and believing in these ideals would actually try to house them and provide them education and public schooling because that was something that of course enslaved people were not provided. In fact it was generally illegal for an enslaved person in the south to be allowed to be literate. In that regard they first put one small girl into the public school system and that didn't cause much of an issue. But then later there were four grown men that needed to be educated because they were unable to read or write, etc. And they placed them into the school system here in Grenell. That turned into a big conflagration. The immediate accusations of sexual predation and the issues of these black men harming our girls and the children became an issue. And the anti-abolitionists started to use the legal system in an attempt to eject these men from the school system. Initially, they tried to pass motions like foreigners could not attend local schools, but that didn't make a lot of sense and didn't pass. And the abolitionists were able to keep them at bay from the legal perspective. This, of course, was the kinder version of the words they used for these people, and I won't repeat them here on this video. But when the anti-abolitionists realized they weren't, at least at this moment, going to win in the legal system, they decided to use a different system, the extrajudicial system. They stormed out of the legal proceedings, armed themselves with clubs, guns, and knives, and decided to form a riot. Initially, they walked directly to the school and were going to intimidate the school principal, Parker. But in knowing that this was happening, a bunch of abolitionists, Parker himself, got around the school and protected it. When they arrived at the school, Parker and the abolitionists would not back down, said they would not allow them to perform their riot and would not allow them to damage the school. This, of course, caused the anti-abolitionists to go into a fervor and realize that while they could not shut down the school, at least not today, what they could do is harm the individuals that were there to attend. They turned around and tried to find the four black men who were now proceeding on their way for their education for that day. The abolitionists realized that these black men were in grave danger, and a local abolitionist named Bigsby intercepted them and gave them guns and knives, revolvers and weapons, and said to them, you're going to have to fight for your rights today. And it was on this property, at least what appears to be this property, based on the monument rock here, saying that this was the original church in 1854, where that standoff actually occurred. On their way to the school, before getting to the school, while passing through what was described as the churchyard, the lynch mob arrived and surrounded these four black men. One of them jumped onto a pile of wood and said to them, we will die here today rather than not be free. Realizing that these men were armed with knives and guns, the anti-abolitionists, the racists, decided that this wasn't the day to die, and they dispersed. These four black men survived only because they were armed with revolvers and knives provided to them by abolitionists who were there to fight for them and their rights. So sadly, the riots continued on for two more days, and that's what actually was able to shut down the school system for that season. Subsequent to that, the anti-abolitionists were able to use the legal system for their goals. 
they passed a measure that stated that any foreigner coming into Grand Nell could not attend the school system unless they were able to pay for at least half of the year's tuition with money out of pocket upon arrival. This, of course, was absolutely impossible for any fugitive slave, and therefore that shut down the school system in Grinnell, at least the public system, for any fugitive slaves from requiring an education. That did not stop the abolitionists, however, and they started just running home schools for these people and educating them that way instead. Now, as for the four black men that defended themselves with knives and guns in front of the mob, it became too dangerous for them to live here in this community, and J.B. Grinnell and others in the Underground Railroad moved them further down the railroad to another depot and another conductor where hopefully they found their way to freedom. So right here in Grinnell is just one more story amongst many in which marginalized people, fugitive slaves or others, are still here today, or at least descendants of them are still here today because of the use of arms. That is something that seems to be lost on a lot of people in the conversation and I find that to be a perplexing thing because our history is filled with instances like this one. But the reality is the intentionally induced amnesia that is in our historical system, especially here in the United States, means that stories like this don't generally get told. And while Grinnell promotes John Brown and his fugitives coming to J.B. Grinnell and being housed here in a depot under J.B. Grinnell's protection, the reality of this 1860 riot, which is far less propagated, is a far more important story about people standing up for themselves, armed and unwilling to back down for their freedom. Now, if any of this sounds very familiar in the year that you're watching this video, it should. The same sort of accusations that were made against these four black men who were merely there to perhaps get an education and become literate, that they were sexual predators, dangerous to our children and girls, should sound very familiar to stuff we're seeing in the news today against other people by similar sorts of bigots. I'm not going to say like, but if you appreciate this sort of content here on InRange TV, please consider supporting me on Patreon. I'm a Patreon-supported only project. I have no sponsors, no overlords, and I'm not advertised on YouTube. I have no AdSense, and I'm demonetized intentionally. So a lot of you out there that have been willing to do that and kept InRange alive for all these years, I'm thankful to you. If you want to see more of this sort of thing, please consider supporting me at patreon.com slash InRange TV. And if you can't, I do understand. Subscribe, and even more importantly, Share with your friends, because this is the sort of stuff we need to be talking about in the firearms community that is sadly neglected. Thank you for watching.